I'm aware most of my videos have started off quiet and then the sounds built up, but not been able to do anything about it. But this week I did a bit of extensive research on Google and I found out that all I needed to do to rectify it was put the mute button on the side of my iPhone on and switch the ringer off and that sorts it. So from about middle of this week, so half of these videos will be uh, like that, silent at the start, but hopefully after that it will be, uh, be okay. But of course then the problem we're gonna have is when I finish doing videos, I forget to put the ringer on and I'll miss lots of calls. But anyway, that's another issue. Um, thank you ever so much for everybody subscribing for all the great comments I've had. Any questions you've got or anything you want to know about, please don't hesitate to ask and hope you enjoyed this week's videos. We're at the farm barbecue and thank you everybody for helping us throughout the last year. On my left we have Brian, who I've known how long Brian all life, 50 a years. Long while, a long know. while, yeah. Brian <laughs> does uh, <laughs> runs the <laughs> Weybridge and helps us when we're bringing all seed rape into store for ADM. Ian Hooton on the left, Ian, how long have you been helping us in the workshop? Eight years. Eight years. Twenty odd years. Twenty odd years. <laughs> Ian used to be in the R and D team at Simba. Yeah, yeah. So we've known Ian a lot with all the Simba machinery. Max is our newest uh, uh, person that we've employed on the farm, and Max is our harvest executive. So only been with us about probably, probably what Max three months? Yeah, since April. William and Peter are the two guys that we contract farm for, and have helped us throughout the last sort of ten to fifteen years. Matt, across there. How long have you been helping us, Matt, at harvest? Just over 10 years now, I think. 10 years time. So Matt's been helping us at harvest time for 10 years. Who's is, Who's is the empty chair? <laughs> that's me. Oh, that's you, Richard. Right. We'll, we'll, come back, come back we'll come back to me. We'll come back to me. Ronda, we all know who Ronda is. Yeah, we'll go. We'll come back. Oh, yeah, yeah. What? Oh, oh, and the dog. Yeah, she, and the dog. She, yeah, yeah. So, so Frankie is our latest addition. She's been with us, what? 18 months? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's not broken anything yet. No, not broken anything yet. <laughs> and we've got, and here, we, with the sunglasses on top of his head, we've got Reuben. And with his back to us, we've got Tom. And these two are our star main men, main men of the oh, farm, boy. can do everything. And of course, the main man who can do everything is me. Thank you very much. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. And then we've got my nephew, Richard. Yeah, nephew Richard here has been on the farm a long, long while. So thank you, everybody, for all you've done for the farm. Thank you. I'm at one of our fields where we're about to have some sewage sludge spread. Seth and Trent will be bringing it later today or tomorrow. And here we've got some of these panels that we lay down to stop the ground getting compacted and rutted because we need to tip the heap out there in the field, probably 30 metres into the field. So I lay these plastic panels down and the lorry's back on here and it completely saves trash in the field. And Jason here brings these, he's been with uh, Seven Trent now with rights for a few years. How many years, Jason? Uh, 10 years. Oh, <laughs> so Jason's been here, coming here 10 years with these panels. But he knows all the fields, gets on well with all the farmers, which obviously is a huge help. And these panels, believe it or not, they're, they're just made of plastic, but they are about £2,000 each. So huge cost, but well worth it. And they've got little locking pins that lock in. There's one. Like that, you just turn that, you'll see in a minute. And that's them all put down. And this lorry, there's 15 on this lorry. And uh, it just depends how far out in the field we want to go, as how many we use. But it's a real good service from Seven Trent. Will they really? They'll take 60 ton? Yeah. Obviously he's using the controls here. All remote wireless and then here's the locking pins so there's some muck in the hole
that's it and just turn the middle and that's locked it on that's locked that panel to the next panel and there's the grab so now we've got all the harvest finished we need to get the grain cool so i'm just going to put the temperature probe that one here it's a long probe on a two meter long pole into that crop and just looking here at these grooves and these ducts in the floor these grills they they've been shut off under the heap halfway up the slope of the of the face and you can just see there the grills and the air will be coming through those there's fans at the back and the air will be coming through those into the crop and there's another one just in front of there so i'm going to go up to the top of that heap and put this uh, put this temperature probe in i'm at the top of the heap now and this is the temperature probe there it's about two meters long it's wireless so it will, uh, the controller at the back of the shed in the fan house will pick up the reading so i'm just going to put this in the crop need to be a bit careful of the roof and then we'll spot that right into the crop as far as it it will go and that's picking up the temperature right down at the base of that probe so we need to remember here this is spear number two or crop two as it says there so we'll go and look um, at the back of the fan house to just to check that that temperature but first of all we're going to go up into the bins just up there and there's another probe in one of the bins we'll just go and check that's in the right place so i'm up at the top of the bins where i was shoveling this heap the other day with the dust and this probe we've got in this bin here is labeled crop one or probe one so we'll just go down into the fan house and check what temperature these bins are because i know they're going to be quite high the same as the shed we've just looked at it's a fairly old system up here on the farm that i'm tenant of and my father put all this in um, a long long while ago but a couple of years ago i did upgrade the controller to some automatic humidity and temperature controllers with the wire free uh, sensors that you've just seen so how this works is that that fan that there generates air and wind and it comes under the bins here there's a channel all the way underneath the bins right up to the right up to the end up there and each bin has a little trap door underneath and we all pull this cable we pull this wire here and that will actually open a trap door under the bin and direct the airflow through that bin and through the crop. But also the shed next door that we've just looked at with probe number um, probe number two, I think it had on it, that probe, that shed rather, is also connected to the same fan under the bins. So that one fan will do the bins and that shed, which obviously saves on the electricity. So the two bins on the left are the ones that uh, are full with, with crop in. So that's the ones now that we want to just check the temperature of at, at that other end. So here we are back in the fan house now, and I've opened the door, which leads outside. Just see it's getting dark. That'll let obviously natural outside air in during the night that'll be cool to uh, blow these fans and blow through the crop. So just looking now at this uh, controller and I'll turn my camera around. Remember the probes we've just put in, crop one, that is the one, the sensor that's in the bins and look at that, 34.2 degrees. Now eventually we need to cool that down to about five degrees because at that temperature, it won't last many days before bugs start to breed and, uh, and the moisture goes up and it will cause all sorts of problems. Crop two isn't a lot better either. And, uh, and that is the shed that we've just put the probe in and that just shows how warm that is as well. So that'll be very interesting to see what those are in the next few days. So we'll put the fans on now. Normally I would run them uh, I would normally run them on automatic, but at the minute, if you look, the outside temperature is is 14.4 and the crop temperature is 34.2 and 32.1. So I'm going to put this on manual at the minute, put it on now. Normally, I'll set this on the timer and I can set the timer in the control here 
so that it just comes on uh, so it just comes on uh, at midnight and runs till 8 a.m., which obviously is economy seven. But I'm going to put these on manually at the minute now and run them from now all the way through till morning and maybe not even switch them off until probably mid-morning tomorrow to get this cool. So we'll see what this uh, has done um, in the next 24 hours. It's Wednesday morning, so I've just come to check the fans and just see how much the temperatures dropped from last night. And if you remember, that's where we were last night on the two sensors. So really, really hot. And now I'll just turn the camera around. There we are. It's staggering that we've brought it down by nearly half on uh, crop one or sensor one and crop two down to 22.8. So it's really staggering amounts in one night when the weather's cooler. You can see at the minute this morning, the air temperature is 13.4. So there's no wonder last night it had been down to 10 or more. And uh, that's why the crops are cool where they are. And the reason why sensor um, one in the bins has come down quicker is because the air under the bins from this older fan here, the air from there gets priority under the bins. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna switch the flap on off under the bins so that there's no air will get to the bins for a few nights and then all the air will go to the shed and that will cool it over the next few nights. So we'll revisit this in, uh, in three or four nights time and see where we are. Morning everyone, it's Wednesday and it's back British farming day where we are supporting and promoting British agriculture all over social media on this special day. And here we are tipping sewage sludge which has come from Seven Trent's treatment works at Stoke Bardoff near Nottingham. And this is just one of the many things we do. And this is a product that we spread all over our fields. We take between 10 and 12,000 tonnes per year and spread it on the land and incorporate it. And it has a huge amount of uh, phosphate, nitrogen, sulphur, and many trace elements in it as well and we incorporate it into the soil and it improves our organic matter. And so it's a fantastic soil conditioner. And it also means that we don't have to buy mined fertilizer out of the ground, which also obviously helps towards plastic waste because that fertilizer comes in plastic bags. So we don't need that either. So this is just one of the many things we do in the countryside and we work alongside many companies. And we have another, another lorry load coming down the track there now. So this particular heap will have about 500 tonnes in it and it was spread on this 45 acre field and incorporated into the soil. So the many things farmers do to help nature, wildlife and the environment are just plentiful. And on behalf of all uh, the farmers, can I thank you for the wonderful support you give to British agriculture and the farmers? Because we do care for nature, environment and wildlife. And it just shows when you look at the fantastic landscape we have in the UK that's managed by livestock and farmers. So thank you for that fantastic support. We've had about 10 millimetres of rain yesterday, which uh, it's a good lot of rain and it's done a bit of good, but I just wanted to show you in this particular field here how the uh, soil and the lumps are still dry inside. If you look at this particular lump here, it's breaking apart there, which is what we want. But then look as you get in the middle, you can see the colour there. We're back to dry again there. So that is, it hasn't gone through that. So that's still very dry. But one of the reasons why we work our soils like this slightly rough and leave them rough is that it enables us to actually stand the weather. So these particular fields, this one here and the one beside this track here won't be planted uh, with wheat until probably the 25th of October. And we do it late because we have a grass weed um, issue for, uh, with a, a weed called black grass. We've really got on top of it in the last few years by delayed drilling winter wheat. Um, but we need to leave the soil in a condition like this that means it is able to withstand any rain we get. And obviously, the further we get into October, the more rain we're likely to get. But leaving a field resilient like this and in a condition to able to withstand rain, it means we can then still get on to plant the next crop. It's Monday afternoon and I'm just delivering some more haylage to one of our equestrian customers near Newark. 
and I've got 10 bales of uh, haylage here. Each one of these bales weighs in the region of 320 kilograms. And you can see the squeezer attachment we use here that squeezes the bales together so it doesn't damage them because we don't want to put any holes in the plastic because if you put a hole in the plastic, air gets into it and the bales start to go mouldy and it actually doesn't do the horses any good. Um, it can do them serious damage if they eat mouldy haylage. So you have to be really, really careful with, with this. But uh, these bales, there's 10 of them here. We've only just started using this for the first time. This crop was cut and this haylage was made about June the 11th and you need about two months on the crop from cutting and wrapping it before you can use it. These bales here have eight layers of plastic on and we put slightly more than, uh, than most people put six on, but we put eight on and it just makes them withstand a little bit more um, handling uh, issues, if you like, so the, the bales are protected better. So the last two bales now left to unload on the trailer. Just a bit of a tight spot where Tina wants them. And she likes them reared upright because then there's not so much wastage and the haylage doesn't go all over the place. So it's just a bit of a job with the lack of room. But do that and then get the squeeze on the end of the bales like that. Normally you can lift them up. There we go, like that. And that's put them all on the end. Just square that one up, like that. And that's all 10 bales reared up, all on the end, ready to use. So that's the haylage underneath the wrapping. It's got nice uh, sweet smell to it. And you can just see the strings there from the baler and all the layers of plastic to protect it. Reuben and Tom are putting the dual wheels on this Puma. We use this transporter to move them about. A lot easier than lugging them by hand and safer. We put the, run them up onto a block of wood rather than use a jack. Again, much quicker and safer. We still use dual wheels rather than wide tires that some people use we let all eight wheels down to eight psi and it gives you much better low ground pressure and less soil damage the only drawback is we have to have an escort on the road but luckily we don't do too much road work so it's not too much of an disadvantage we we'll put these clamps on they hold them on That's it, that's fastened in. And then put three more on this wheel. And then there's, so that's four on the front and six clamps on the back. We're now lifting it up to put the rear wheels on. See there how it just lifts it off the ground. Max is very conscientious about keeping his cab clean. So he's now started to walk around in his socks. Thank goodness we've got concrete.
That top bar supports the wheel and now Ruben's pumping that handle. It's drawing those two together, which in turn lifts the wheel off the floor. Then you can turn it on those rollers. going out cutting around some dike banks and two or three other areas and notice the bearing has gone so it's not going to do any more damage so we'll get these four fields done around the outside and then uh, get this stripped down and new bits ordered I think it just needs a new plate there because that's got a great big hole in it now probably new shaft there and uh, the end cap there with the bearing in you can see it there moving about I'm just about to take the combine header or the front of the combine that cuts the crop up to another farm in a building for the winter it's been washed we did it a couple of days ago and uh, it's all protected as well but we haven't washed in the, in here in the bearings and in the wet where the gears are because it's not being used now and the water will sit in the bearings and uh, they'll rust and then they'll fail so we'll have to change those if we're not careful so we don't rush that or wash the actual wearing parts of it and you can also see as well that the tube or the auger that carries the crop to the middle that's now shiny we've sprayed that with a mixture of oil and diesel and that just protects it stops the rust setting in and just keeps it in good condition when it's not being used and uh, generally all our machinery is washed and put away for the winter and we like to do that because it does protect them and the, the price this machinery is today and it just keeps the paintwork in a lot better condition just to keep them undercover as much as we can. Working the area that we're going to have an agri wheat plot in. We're just going through with this express to mix the soil and the straw because the plot drill that agri will bring needs a fairly good seed bed and a lot finer soil than our drill. We'll probably do it once more with this express and then go through with the Alita, which will loosen it a bit deeper. And then the rest of the field, we've got a Claydon direct drill coming to try. The direct drill, the rest of the field. going around at quite a pace which obviously mixes the straw and the soil better than bigger discs and it creates smaller clods as well smaller lumps of soil and then the roller at the back firms it the DD roller here firms it and this is the one that we uh, 
We changed the scraper rail off a couple of weeks ago, you saw in a previous video, for when it's a bit tacky, the scrapers actually work a lot better down there than they do when they're up at the top here. But that's the layout of this Simbra Express. It's a 2010 machine, but it does a really good job. As with all Simba equipment, really well built. This is now the second time, and that's made a big difference. That's really good, that is. Really mixed it up well compared to that over there. So that's what we'll do. We'll do it twice and then go run through with our Alita and then that'll be fit for them to uh, drill. But hopefully it'll green up and then we'll spray it off with glyphosate. The uh, um, plot won't be drilled until the middle of October, 25th of October time because it's in a continuous wheat situation. This field uh, this year will be six years in wheat. Yeah, really pleased with that, doing a good job. So now I've got the roller off the mower and you can see straight away the problem. The bearing has obviously been gone for quite a while. There and this plate, you can see there, it's worn the hole as well. So we're gonna need a new side plate, new little stub shaft there, bearing and probably that end cap as well. But looking at it, now I've got it off, it, uh, it looks like that this one is going as well or gone. So we need two bearings. So we'll see if we can get this sorted um, and get this, get this mower back to, back to work in order again fairly quickly. Sausage is on one this morning. <laughs> Anyway, it's all go here. We've got uh, Seven Trent bringing some uh, more sludge for us. This is sewage sludge that we're going to spread on the fields. And we've got the excavator stockpile in it here. And uh, this field is coming sugar beet. And obviously this will provide us a lot of uh, phosphate, sulfur, huge amount of trace elements for this sugar beet crop. Morning, everybody. We've got some more sewage sludge being tipped today. That's lots of lovely organic matter, phosphate, nitrogen, sulfur, whole load of trace elements. Absolutely fantastic for our crops. Got quite a few lorries here in the background as well and the digger stockpile in it. This field's coming sugar beet and it's fantastic for the crop. Um, all we need to do is just put some potash on and that's the job sorted for, for this crop. So really, really good product. Just having a check of our long-term cover crop trial field. Some of you remember who saw the video a week or two ago, three, two weeks ago. We established this field straight after harvest. Yes, it was late to establish a cover crop in September, but we only combined the field the day before, and so we couldn't do anything else. But it further ex ex uh, example is a further example of my thoughts on cover crops on heavy land. Just really um, do not work in some situations. We've had crop failures here when establishing crops after the cover crop because the soil goes so solid. So this year we've tried now, actually when we've established the crop, we've established it in, in rows 45 centimetres wide. We had a, um, a Simba Unipress on the back of our Elita. This is the converted machine we used to, um, for establishing all seed rape. And uh, we had the Elita on the back, which I'll just show you a quick clip of that.
So that was the machine we've used to establish it. But the, the great thing is we've got this lovely crumbly soil structure now here. You can just see there the crumbs and uh, great soil structure there to establish next year's um, next year's spring sip, spring barley um, in this crop. But I'll just turn the camera around and show you um, the problem we've got. So we've got some good establishment of that some of the cover crop here and there and, and down here, some more coming up through here, but we've got slug damage here. And so um, here, look at this, the leaves have actually been eaten off there. And so I've just been on this morning with some slug pellets um, to, uh, to try and control these slugs. And here we are, you can just see, we've got a pellet there, there, because we're only putting on two and a half kilos a hectare, you can't see many pellets dotted around. But there is some quite substantial damage and a bit of flea beetle damage there as well. You've got the hole in the leaf, telltale sign. But when you start looking at some of the damage, that leaf's been eaten away, the edge, slugs. So uh, this further um, really just emphasises my point on how difficult crops, cover crops are on heavy soils. And uh, if we can find some more, yeah, cover crop, that's coming quite nicely there. We've got a mix here um, of, so this is what we use now for, for putting slug pallets on. Here's the applicator spinner, pallets are in there, spinning disc at the, on the bottom there, on the back of our Polaris ATV and uh, we've got a little sprayer on the back we have a six metre boom on for doing various little jobs but again this really emphasises my issues with this that we've got the cost of establishing the crop that's machinery cost um, with fuel labour depreciation and all that seed we've um, also now got a slug pellet uh, cost as well that all those three costs we would not have had if we didn't put a cover crop in the field and all these costs have to come off the the um, cereal the following spring barley um, cost that we're actually going to have when we have spring barley next year so the cost of this field nearly every year we've been doing this trial we compare it to the field just over the hedge there and the returns from this year this field are far lower because the yield is lower but also the costs are higher because of the extra things we have to do and this is really um, really reinforces my view on why cover crops on heavy land do not stack up we're busy loosening the ground here that's coming winter wheat again you can see it's very hard and dry really really heavy land this very tough field but it's not doing a bad job we're not going to be drilling this for about a month so uh it'll be it'll be all right this will by the time it gets some rain on it wets and dries and things but it's really wet at this end it can be so it's not doing too bad a job this culture press on the back we've only had it about uh, three or four months and with every machine we just like to get all the hydraulic pipes labeled up and color coded with cable ties so they uh, they all operate the same way so obviously you've got two blues two yellows and two reds the wings the leveling boards and also the uh, ram and so two there and two there and the same two yellow two yellow and it all corresponds so every tractor we get in the lever in the cab works the same way or the switch works in the same way we know what works which lever works which and that stone by the way you can see there that's uh, what was found at harvest this tractor's on the grain trailer and it was found at harvest so we always try and remove all the stones off the fields if we can uh, so on the pipes got uh, one set of pipes for the up and down of the draw bar and lowering it into work got another set of pipes that, and rams that work the leveling boards here and then the last set of pipes and rams are for the wings here and so there's three sets and these are color coded as well and also if you just notice that chain it used to have a ratchet strap on it but we've made that it's a lot easier and quicker and safer and it just obviously you need that on on the road to stop the wings dropping down if a hydraulic pipe bursts this is the area that agri are going to have their winter wheat trial plot on lots of different varieties grown here we'll go through that when it's uh, when it's planted which will be in about a month's time the rest of the field is going to be direct drilled 
You can see the remnants of last year's plots, the narrow areas, and that's what it will like here. And I'm just going through with the Simba culture press just to finish it off. Being raised a bit better surface for the plot drills to run because they require a lot different soil structure and finish than the normal drills do. So I'm just finishing that off and leaving this for the weather to do the rest. 